Um, as a means of starting to think about what we mean by practice-focused teacher education, I want to start off this morning by looking at two artifacts of teacher education practice. Um, one is a syllabus, and the other is a video of a teacher educator actually uh, doing teacher education. And let's take a few minutes just to quickly skim over that syllabus, which uh, comes from a published book edited by Smorginski and White, and I apologize for the incomplete citation um, on the handout. But take a look at the syllabus and think about the ways in which it does or does not suggest practice-focused teacher education to you. So let's just take about 60 seconds here. So this is a video of a colleague of mine, Sarah Scott, who's a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh. And she is working with pre-service teachers at the University of Michigan. And this video was taken a couple of years ago. And I'm showing it with the permission of everyone involved. Um, this, these are intern teachers who are in, I believe, their first month of training at the University of Michigan. And they are learning to teach um, uh, lower elementary, I, I believe it was lower elementary readers. And they are preparing to, the, the intern in the video is preparing to uh, read a storybook out loud to students. And she's getting ready to do this and is later that day going to go into a classroom of children and do this, this storybook read aloud with them. Oh, if he catches a fish. And you guys are going to have to read to find out what happens on the last page. As you're reading, oh, who has the marker? Ryan, you just used it for the fish. Oh, <laughs> you stole the good, this is the good one. Don't steal it. Yeah. Um, a word that's kind of tricky. Would you ask them what it is? Like, We're going to see the word wind. We're going to see the word wind, which looks like this. You know. I think you but, want to confront the what they think that word is. Mm -hmm. So how can we say that? It's really the same as wind, but here. Would you ask wind. them? So you or could if, ask them. So yeah, you could. Or, so we see this. Would you say like we see this word? Like how would you read it? And then like wind, and then like it. It does mean wind. It also means wind. So in this book, it means wind because they're winding in the line with the fish on it. We're also going to see a different form of wind, winding. And then we're going to see the past tense form, which is wound. Careful with your use. <laughs> yep. And you can underline that OU. If we're reinforcing vowels in the word work, you can underline the OU, which makes the ow wound, makes the ow sound. OK. Sarah uh, had a question? Yeah, they've probably heard the word wine as far as like don't wine or wind, W-H-I-N-E-D. Is that something oh, we should even wind. think about? Huh, I hadn't thought about that. So he whined, W-H-I-N-D, also sounds the same. Um, <laughs> I, mean, maybe we wouldn't I wouldn't go wind. there. Mm -hmm. I would go with the, the, the homograph, wind and wind, mm -hmm. and leave the homophone alone. OK. If you, I mean, some of you have gotten to know the kids pretty well, and you can make a joke about wine, W-H-I-N-D. Um, but if you think it's going to be confusing, I wouldn't go there. OK? So as you're reading. OK. So while you're reading, I want you to think about Sophie's new experience while she's fishing. I want you to think about how her experience is different than Daniel and Ella's, but also think about how it's the same. Mm -hmm. And, oh, and I guess think about specific examples in the text or in the words that will support what you decide or say. When you fin if you finish reading early? If you finish reading early, I want you to go back and reread. Because? Because, or, I don't know, go back and reread and look for more examples. To prepare for our discussion. Yeah. Other ideas for focus questions? There are a lot of similarities in my mind between what we saw here and the photograph that Deborah just showed us of the medical students learning to practice. And I think the thing that stands out most to me is that in both cases, the professional educator has a really clear idea in his or her head of what the student is supposed to be learning and what he or she needs to do to help the, the novice learn to do those things. And it's, it's very striking to me, particularly in comparison to what we sometimes see in teacher education. 
Yeah, I think that's right. There's nothing vague in that lesson. The teacher educator, Sarah Scott, has a very clear sense of what she wants students to, to learn to do in that session. And she is not hesitant to say, no, do not do it that way. Do it this other way instead, which I think, again, is very um, distinctive about this. So we have a whole panel of people who are going to talk with us about some of these issues today. But before they start, I want to leave us with three features that I think not, not just myself, but lots of people who think about what practice-focused teacher education is sometimes point to when they try to define this concept. Um, and we can see some of this across the two examples that we just looked at. So one feature that I think is probably the most crucial is that Practice-based teacher education is based on a curriculum that is focused on specific skills and practices of teaching and on the knowledge and orientations that support them. And on that last point that we just heard, I think the, the notion of specificity here is really important. In practice-focused teacher education, I don't think a teacher educator is feeling vague about what's supposed to happen in a course or what students are supposed to learn. It's not just whatever comes up in practicum one day or whatever people happen to be interested in thinking about in a methods course. The, the, the driving notion here is that there's a set of specific things that people are supposed to learn to do as novices before they're ready to assume responsibility for a classroom on their own. And then um, going along with that, practice-based teacher education generally has instructional activities and special settings for learning teaching that support this approach to professional training. So there are repeated opportunities for novices to practice these specific teaching skills with close and often very prescriptive coaching and in settings that support professional learning. This particular video clip was taken um, in the Ann Arbor Public Schools in a special summer program that um, is working closely with the University of Michigan to let novices practice under a lot of supervision in the summer um, on students in summer school. And the setting is very carefully designed to support that work. And it's work that uh, Magdalene Lampert um, first began several years ago, and it has yielded uh, enormous benefits for our students. And then finally, and we don't see this here, I think assessment is a crucial component of practice-focused teacher education. Um, implementing periodic and then culminating performance assessments that actually tell us whether novices can do the practices we care about to a common standard that will support them in doing what they need to do to help kids learn is crucial. So let's try to keep these three ideas in mind as the day goes on, and you can see whether you agree with them or disagree with them or want to add to them. And then just before I end, I want to point out what is probably on everyone's mind, which is that this is certainly nothing that's easy to achieve. Which stand is blocking it? This one, the banner. This, the banner. Can you move that? It's the, they're referring to the banner over there. That's blocking from the other room. Yeah. yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, I, this is not easy to achieve. I think it would take quite a lot of collective work across multiple seg uh, sectors of education. And just to kind of hand wave at a few of them, I think having a common K through 12 curriculum or something similar is crucial because it's hard to build really prescriptive teacher education if we don't know what somebody needs to learn to teach. And the common core, I think, is certainly a step in the right direction there. It would take collective work to identify teaching practices that we all think are essential to beginners because we can't continue to make this stuff up on our own. And it makes no sense, for instance, if we at Michigan are training people to do one set of things and then they're going and getting hired somewhere else where there's another set of expectations in place. We would need common standards for what we think novices should be able to do and performance assessments that go along with them. Um, as someone said a few minutes ago, we would need to develop our own capacity as teacher educators to do this work. It takes a lot to do what we saw Sarah Scott doing on that video, and I think many of, many of us are struggling to learn to do that ourselves, and there's, there's quite a bit to learn there. Um, and finally, we would need to work with an eye toward continuous improvement, probably in cycles where we could share with each other what we're learning and try to improve what we're doing on a collective level, not just program uh, by program. But we're going to hear lots more about this on this panel and then throughout the day. And I look forward to hearing what you think about all this. Thanks. My name is Lynn Goodwin. And I'm uh, one of the people involved, a uh, project director for our residency program, ERTC, which stands for Teaching Residence at Teachers College. And I'm here with my colleague, Emily Reagan. Um, and we're going to, um, like Deborah and Susan, and Susan do a duet. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the first part. I'd like to just sort of offer you a, um, a simple overview of our program um, where um, I just sort of provide a context. 
um, describe some of uh, the distinguishing features of TRTC, and then uh, you know sort of focus most of our time um, with Emily's um, help and direction use of a program. This program is funded by the U.S. Department of Education. It's, it's one of the Teacher Quality Partnership Grant um, programs, and um, it is, I think, one of 20, uh, 28 um, programs across the country. All right. Of course, at Teachers College, uh, we are a graduate institution only, so this is a graduate level program that leads to, leads to a master's degree, and it runs for 14 months. So in 14 months, we, um, you know, sort of all of us, um, those of us in the program, as well as residents, um, leap out of the blocks and are running um, very, very hard until the end of the 14 months um, are over. Um, residents are all placed with experienced mentor teachers in high need New York City public schools that work with us as partners. So we are working with, um, in settings, um, with teachers who on a day-to-day -day basis um, are in sort of real New York City placements um, and real New York City contexts, um, as, which are complicated um, and diverse um, and multi-layered and present all kinds of opportunities as well as challenges. Our residents, um, I said, earn a master's degree, particularly in three areas, teaching English to speakers of other languages, um, in intellectual um, disabilities uh, slash autism, and in secondary inclusive education. And the focus is entirely on secondary school, um, primarily high school, but also in middle school. And they all meet requirements um, for New York State certification in a new certification area um, called Teaching Students with Disabilities or in a continuing area, which is TESOL in grades K to 12. Um, one of the features of this program and the grant is that uh, residents commit to teach for three years. Um, and so um, they will not be part of the, um, the, the big bump of folks who have you know, one year of teaching experience, hopefully. Um, we are proud to say that our first cohort uh, just finished their first year of teaching and they're all um, continuing um, to be uh, teachers next year. Um, most of them are staying in their schools. Some of them are moving, um, but they are all um, in place and committed um, to continue teaching. We also provide, uh, once they finish our 14-month program, uh, two years of induction support. So the good news is that we continue to work with them and to interact with them and to support them um, beyond um, our program. And that is something I think that um, all of us in teacher education really need to pay serious attention to. Um, it's always a matter of funding and resources and time and where our graduates go. Um, and so we're lucky that our graduates must teach in New York City schools, and so they are close to us. But simply um, being close um, doesn't necessarily mean that it makes induction easy, and we have learned a great deal about how challenging induction is. Let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the program itself um, and what sort of distinguishes it um, in, in several ways. The first is that despite the fact that all our students are um, in regular teacher preparation programs here at Teachers College, they all participate in what we call a core TRTC curriculum. And this came about because um, certifications are categorical. And so folks prepare to be certified in a particular area or grade level or subject. Um, um, specific um, um, uh, place. But the reality is that students are not categorical. Um, they come in as whole people. They're not simply there to learn mathematics. They're not simply there as middle schoolers. Um, they are whole human beings who bring a variety of capacities and needs um, with them. And we wanted to be sure that our residents, regardless of their certification, would all have access um, and be prepared to work with the students who are actually going to be in front of them. And this means understanding many of the issues that Deborah was talking about earlier around social inequities and poverty um, and language and immigrant status and what have you. So that if you're um, a special ed teacher, you do not have, you cannot have the luxury to say, I don't know anything about English language learners, I'll just wait for the specialist. That is not what our um, goal is. So this curriculum exposes everyone um, 
to what we feel is sort of basic and foundational for any teacher who's going to be entering, um, particularly an urban, um, challenging, high-need environment. Of course, they are all in residency placements, and um, they begin those. Um, they, they enter schools at the same time that teachers do before kids um, actually begin. So they are part of the planning and cleanup and preparation. And they are in those schools until um, the end of the school year. Um, so our residents uh, basically just finished their residency um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, in the fall, they're in their placements three full days a week um, because the fourth day they work with a community-based organization, and I'll talk about that in a, sen in, in a second. And in the spring, they're in their four days because the fifth day is where we have um, our integrating seminar, which is where that core curriculum happens because there has to be a place um, where you can wrangle with practice um, and bring together all that you're learning about teaching with all that you're doing um, in teaching. And so that's a space where we are constantly um, trying to bridge that gap and really focusing um, on practice. Folks have multiple levels of support. Um, and I'll just kind of give you a quick list because we want to spend most of our time um, talking about education rounds. But they all work with a mentor teacher. Um, and we work very, very hard. I shouldn't say we, it's actually Emmy, Emily who works very, very hard to find folks who um, are willing, able to share their classroom and their practice, but also to be um, co-teachers with our residents. So one thing that our residents do from day one is that they are co-teachers and co-planners with their mentor teachers. Of course, this varies and looks different from setting to setting. But we learned in the first year what many of you as teacher educators know, um, that it is hard for a mentor teacher sometime uh, to give up the classroom, that you may have um, one student teacher have an experience that is full of opportunities for rich practice, and another who is spending most of his or her time um, observing um, or grading papers or doing Xeroxing. And we did not want that to happen. That practice time is much too critical. They work with um, a residency supervisor that is assigned uh, by Teachers College. Um, and that person becomes sort of the glue between them and the program. And that is not what most programs do, um, that you work with supervisors. I think the only difference is that we try to um, create a professional community among mentor teachers, residency supervisors, and the TRTC team, so that we're constantly sort of um, engaged in conversation. Plus, there is very specific training that goes along with being a supervisor as well as being a mentor teacher. The last bit is enrichment, and this is where the community-based organizations come in. Um, as I said, in the fall, all our residents um, volunteer with um, uh, CBOs that are part of Col Columbia Community Service, which is sort of Columbia's local foundation that serves agencies in the Harlem area. Um, and most of these agencies offer educational enrichment. And um, you know, when I was sort of designing this curriculum, one thing I wanted folks to understand is that learning and education don't just happen in schools. Um, and that no matter what the community, every community has lots of resources and every family um, is, is in some way you know, seeking those resources um, to, in order to you know, further support um, their own lives as well as the lives of their children. I wanted uh, residents to be able to interact with families and with learners outside the formal setting that schools present. Um, and I wanted them to, ha to kind of come to develop a mindset about seeking resources themselves um, in communities. A second piece of enrichment is that, you know, one of the disadvantages of a residency program is that you end up in one placement um, for the entire year. And as wonderful as that placement may be, it becomes your sort of worldview um, for teaching. And I wanted to be sure that folks had an opportunity to be in a different placement. So in the middle of the year, for a month, um, our residents are placed in a different partnership school um, as um, guest residents in some sense. The relationship is not different, they're not, I mean, it's not the same. We're not doing the same kind of intensive work that they do with their mentor teachers. Um, but it gives them an opportunity to spend a little time, not hop in for an observation, but to live in the school for a, a different school, grade level setting for a month, and to get uh, to know um, um, just a different perspective 
on just about everything. Um, our residents resist us every single time because they are sort of all tied up with their students and their residencies, and then um, they are sort of opened up as a consequence of being able to see something new. How am I doing? Exactly, I did that very well, thank you. I'm usually blah, 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 on and on, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of myself. So let me introduce my colleague, um, Emily Reagan, um, to you. Emily is the coordinator of our, of our partnership schools and works very, very closely with them, and is also the person who um, helped, uh, helped me to really to you know, bring to life this idea of education rounds into the residency program. My original conception was that we would do education rounds sort of a la Dick Elmore with um, sort of schools working with um, one another. And that vision is still in place, but we started you know, a few steps back focusing primarily on our students um, to help them begin to be part of these professional learning communities that focus on practice. Emily. So we've already heard a couple references to the medical profession and learning, um, using the teacher education to learn from the medical profession. And the edu education rounds model is no different. It builds on the medical rounds model in which experienced physicians alongside medical interns rotate through teaching hospitals to examine real life cases and develop uh, teaching or develop uh, diagnostic and treatment skills. Um, our work with uh, TRTC Education Rounds builds primarily, or was informed primarily, as Lynn was mentioning, on the work of City and Elmar at Harvard University, who implemented instructional rounds as a way in which to develop networks of superintendents, administrators, and or teachers um, to, around a particular problem of practice, then to engage in observations of teachers in schools, and debrief on the, uh, on the observations as a way to improve teaching practice and ultimately student learning. Um, Tom Delpreet at uh, Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts was the first to implement rounds at the teacher education level uh, in which he engaged teacher education faculty, uh, practicing teachers, and pre-service teachers um, around a particular curricular issue. So they would go in, um, have an orientation around the curricular issue, go into classrooms to observe experienced teachers, and then provide written feedback. Our model in some ways blends those two, and we'll talk about a little further what that means. Our themes, uh, particularly in T uh, TRTC, for our education rounds were threefold. First, they were to expose residents to vulnerability by displaying their practice for development. Residents had multiple opportunities to display their practice for, as Lynn was mentioning, the university-based supervisors who are constantly in their classrooms and constantly observing for their mentor teachers, but we found value in the residents exposing themselves and exposing their practice to their peers and to other TRTC staff who are operating in a non-evaluative, uh, non-supervisory supervisory capacity. Um, we also wanted the residents to engage in both individual and collective inquiry. So they were looking at problems of practice, both as to how it would inform their own practice, but how together as a group they could look at a particular problem. And finally, we wanted residents not necessarily to focus on a particular technical skill, but rather to build habits of mind and practice that they would start to develop in pre-service teacher education and carry through into their first years of teaching. Uh, so our Education Rounds model was first implemented this past spring, in the spring of 2012. It took place over one semester, over the spring semester. So they had already been in their residency placements for a full semester, and were now engaging, and you know, they had had experience, they knew the students, they had built relationships with their mentor teachers, and were at a place in which they could display their practice for others. Um, it took place, uh, there were four Education Rounds that took place monthly from February through May. And we started with um, an orientation in January to familiarize the residents with the steps, to talk, about them, uh, talk with them about the purpose of the education rounds. Um, across those four rounds, each resident had the oppo opportunity in small groups to observe six of his or her peers. And similarly, each resident had the opportunity to be observed by two groups of his or her peers. So the residents had both the opportunity to observe and provide feedback, and also to be observed and to receive feedback and to inquire into their own practice by displaying their practice to others. Uh, there were four elements drawing largely on the city and Elmore model. 
that were integral to the education rounds process. Um, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in depth, but they are the question of practice, the observation of practice, the observation debrief, and next steps. And in your handout in the packet, um, on, the on the back side, I believe, of your packet, uh, you should see the steps outlined in greater detail, which we'll talk about now. So the first step was the question of practice. And the question of practice, we asked each resident to identify a particular question of practice that would focus the observation for their peers and for the TRTC staff who were engaged in the education rounds. We asked the residents to develop questions that were directly observable. So ones in which observers could take descriptive data around and have discussions in the debrief uh, around those questions of practice. For example, one resident asked, um, what are my students doing to solicit assistance? And how often do I approach students who are not outwardly seeking help? Another resident asked, what questioning techniques am I using? And how am I formally and informally assessing my students? So these questions of practice, which were derived from questions or issues or problems of practice that they were individually grappling with, really served as the focus of their observations. We guided them not to ask questions that were difficult to observe. So a question of practice such as, are my students engaged? We pushed them to operationalize and to define what does engagement look like for them? So that in their debriefs, it was not about, well, I thought they were engaged because of X, and I thought they were engaged because of Y, but rather they were digging deeper into what are the students particularly doing or saying? The observation of practice, as I mentioned, uh, each resident was observed twice by two groups of peers. And the observation of practice took place uh, over one class period. So they were essentially observed by two groups over two class periods. Um, during the, the observation, the host residents were teaching, and the observing residents were completing an observation protocol that uh, outlined what are the students doing, what is the teacher or the teachers doing, and then also what is the task. And this, uh, we asked residents to take obs descriptive observation data, really s focusing on the question of practice. We didn't want them to spend the entire class period jotting down every single thing that they saw, but rather focusing as much as they could on evidence, descriptive data, around that specific question of practice. The observation debrief took place back at Teachers College. So the observation took place in the residency placements. The observation debrief took place back at Teachers College during the integrating seminar that Lynn mentioned on Friday. And the during the observation debrief, the residents followed a very structured protocol. They began in their small groups with the observing and the host resident by looking through their observation notes to identify specific pieces of evidence that related directly back to the question of practice. They would jot down each piece of evidence on a post-it note, and together then they would go into the analysis phase, where on chart paper, in their small groups, they look across all of the pieces of evidence to identify uh, patterns and trends. So they were looking, again, at the very descriptive level for what trends are we seeing that are related directly back to the question of practice. The final piece of the debrief was the next steps. And in this portion of the debrief, um, we would sit with the residents, so the residents in their small groups would think about, would talk across their residency experiences. Perhaps one resident was experiencing success around the particular question of practice and could share recommendations. This would be an opportunity to ask questions about the question of practice and then to develop recommendations for next steps. So instead of um, us, me talking or Lynn talking about the experience of the, of the residents in the education rounds process, we have three short video clips and each one talks a little bit about the ways in which the residents experience the education rounds. Um, the first one is Lidge Lewis, who was a resident in the Secondary Inclusive Education Program, and he was talking about what it was like to be observed as a resident. Um, the residents, a common theme was that, that it was very nerve-wracking for the residents to have their peers come into the classroom um, to observe them, and then what kind of feedback were they going to get? So here is Lidge's experience. You might think in the beginning, oh, well, the folks are coming over. Or I'm, you know, a little nervous. But really, once they come into the classroom, it's like, hey, my 
my friends are here. So uh, rather than being nervous, you really shift in the fifth gear. At least that's the way I felt. And uh, it's, you know, somewhat, it's, sometimes it's like showtime. <laughs> um, being the one who was observed and, uh, you know, sitting through the debriefing process, yeah, that, that can be somewhat of a pins and needles type of session because you don't know, uh, at least at that point, what they saw uh, or what was said, uh, you know, what kind of feedback you're going to get. So you, you kind of sit there for about, you know, 10 minutes, you know, just kind of twiddling your thumbs and, and waiting uh, anxiously, perhaps, as to well, what they're going to come back with. But it was very productive, you know, I, I would say. Uh, I, I forgot who had come, you know, aside from Brendan, I forgot who else was in the, uh, in the audience, maybe Jaleesa as well. Um, but when it was time for the debrief and they had all their post-it notes up on the wall, uh, the feedback was quite constructive. So as you can see, and this is just one example, the residents really found value in the process of having low stakes um, opportunities to be observed and then to engage in what's going on, what patterns are fellow residents seeing, what patterns are fellow are TRTC staff members seeing during the education rounds process. The next clip is a clip of Megan Kinsilla, who is a resident in our TESOL program. And she's talking about the, observing a fellow resident, Carolyn Sinclair McCullough, who is a resident in the Secondary Inclusive Education Program. And she starts by talking about um, how the question of practice really was a frame for the observation. Well, I think the, I really liked the questions that were both really quantitative, like how many times did my students ask for help? Um, because those were very easy to measure descriptively. We could take tallies, we could draw diagrams. Um, and I think also showed a lot. I mean, if, if you could say to one of our, one of, if I could say to one of my peers, you spoke with this student 17 times and this student one time, I mean, that says a lot. Um, so I, in, I think and residents who pose those types of questions, we were able to gather a lot of data, just um, numerical data that was helpful, um, but also some of the other questions um, that were more um, sort of anecdotal observations or things like that were sometimes harder to answer descriptively, but um, I think also really important. Uh, one time I was observing one of my classmates who was in a co-teaching situation, and I think um, the co-teaching for many of us has been sort of a hard to navigate situation, especially when it's more sort of in the push-in context, when there's not a lot of opportunity to co-plan or to to really co-teach as, as sort of equals or to be seen as equals in the classroom. Um, so when I was able to observe Carolyn, I was able to see that she, um, while she wasn't taking the lead in the classroom, she had a really important integral role. Um, a lot of the students called her by name. Um, to come over and help them when they were working in small groups and on their own and um, you know she also clearly was following along with the material and seeing that was really encouraging because I think sometimes as co-teachers you're not really sure how valuable your role is or how what that role is supposed to look like or even how you can best support your students and it was good to see the many different ways that she supported the students in that classroom and to see also sort of from an outside perspective that even though she wasn't standing at the front of the classroom, she still had a really important role. Um, she was very open to the feedback. I think her questions, if I remember correctly, were more um, sort of quantitative. And I think I actually sort of modeled my questions around hers because I liked, she asked a lot about like how students asked for help. Did she favor certain students? Um, and it's like, was she always assisting the same students? Um, what were students doing when she approached them? Things like that. Um, and I think the, the cool thing about the doing these um, like descriptive observations is that it's you're not really telling a person something they don't already know. I mean, you're sort of acting as a mirror and reflecting what you saw them doing, which I think they often know that they're doing those things or they, they experience how their students responded. Um, but it's still reaffirming and I think um, validating to hear it spoken back to you and also you can't always see that you know the kids at the table behind you all had their hand raised while you talked to the students at this table so I think teachers are excited to get that kind of feedback because they don't realize sometimes how their even just like movements in the room may affect different students. 
So not only was she. Well, I think oh. the I really liked the. So not only was she inquiring, you know, in looking at Carolyn's practice, but thinking about how that relates to her process of education rounds and how Carolyn's context could inform her, her context as well, which was very different. Uh, the final clip is of Andy Sullivan, who is a TESOL resident um, in, our, in our program. And he was talking about some of what he viewed as the important pieces of the, of the TRTC education rounds, and particularly talks about the mindset that he was developing while engaging in the education rounds. I think the best thing is the feedback um, that you get in relation to specific questions you have about what you're doing in the classroom and what the kids are doing in the, in the classroom. Um, so getting in that mind frame of coming up with specific ways to improve or specific questions you have um, gets you thinking like a teacher, gets you thinking like someone who's looking for uh, results and, and research and feedback to improve their teaching and not just worrying about it. Um, so getting out of the mindset of just thinking about the overwhelming quantity of things to improve on and focusing on specific things and, and thinking about getting feedback from the people who are in the room or the people that you really trust. Um, it's a really empowering way of thinking about teaching and process for viewing growth in your own practice. So I would say that, yeah, just the mindset of getting into how you might improve and how you might enlist the services of others to help you improve was really useful. Probably the most important thing, I think. At the final debrief, um, after all of our education rounds had taken place, we asked residents to create posters, uh, articulating or describing visually what they had learned through the education rounds process, and then also what next steps, how they could incorporate aspects of education rounds as first and second year teachers. Um, this poster here, I'll just touch on a couple of themes that we saw, and these were common across the, the small groups. One was the aspect of building community and the importance of peer feedback and support, um, using descriptive observations to improve teaching practice, um, thinking about interdisciplinary learning, looking across subject matter and contexts, um, and also learning about um, and from uh, different school settings, from different students, and different teaching styles. This poster here, we have Edgy Man, Edgy, uh, Ed Rounds Man, um, but if you look <laughs> on the right side there with the next steps, these were some ideas that the residents generated as ways in which they could incorporate pieces of the education rounds um, into their first years of teaching. So things like providing a question of practice for people who would be observing them, including administrators or supervisors. Um, combining, um, continuing low inference observations, particularly in co-teaching settings. And also requesting informal observations of peers and colleagues as a means in which to improve practice um, and to reflect and to continue developing as teachers. So what we learned from the education rounds process this past semester was that it really was an opportunity for residents to continue practicing and reflecting on their teaching practice, and it truly fostered a uh, community of learners. But we also found a need to dig deeper into teaching practice. The residents often stated a very superficial level in terms of providing feedback, and we're hoping um, as we implement them next year that we'll uh, have that will uh, provide opportunities for them to dig further and to be more serve more as critical friends. Um, we also hope, as Lynn was mentioning, to involve mentor teachers and TC faculty in the education rounds process. This year we started with the residents and our TRTC staff, and we'd like to expand our education rounds and the reach and the possibilities of the rounds. Um, we'd also like to continue the education rounds process during induction. And finally, we are engaging in research on education rounds in terms of the processes, what are the experiences of the residents, and ultimately we'd like to look at what are the outcomes of the education rounds in particular on teaching practice um, and hopefully on student learning. Hi, I'm Betsy Davis from the University of Michigan where I'm a faculty member in science education and the chair of the elementary teacher education program. I'm glad to be here, particularly after our travel travails yesterday, which were very exciting. I got to see Albany, which is nice. Um, <laughs> so 
As, we, uh, as, as I get started, I'll be talking today about the work we've been doing at the, at the program level uh, at the University of Michigan with our elementary teacher education program, and in particular, our undergraduate program. This work has been um, taking place over a number of years. A number of us have been working on this for a long, long time. And in 2010, we constituted a group called the Elementary Curriculum Design Group to continue this work and to um, really embark on the program level uh, design, design work that we wanted to engage in. So as I share this work with you today, please know that um, this has been an enormously collaborative effort uh, and we've really been working hard on this over a number of years and I'd like to particularly acknowledge a couple of colleagues, um, including Lori Sleep, who's here today, and Tim Burst, who's not able to be here today, um, who have helped um, enormously with the program leadership and as well as um, earlier instantiations of this talk. And I'd also like to acknowledge a few other members of the elementary curriculum design group who are here today, including Megan Shaughnessy, and marie Palansar, and Deborah Ball. So today what I'd like to focus in on is giving you a little bit of a sense of how I think about uh, elementary teacher education and what makes it complicated. We'll take on the University of Michigan program as an example that is oriented around practice and also subject matter serious and takes very seriously the ethical obligations of teaching. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the program design, the challenges so that we face in this program design work as well. So typically, uh, teacher education has used a couple of pedagogies. Pedagogies of reflection and pedagogies of investigation. These really work to support beginning teachers in developing a really critical knowledge base and the analytical skills that they need as teachers. And as teacher educators, we're really pretty good at those. However, teaching is inherently, as we've been hearing today, is inherently both interactive and contingent. So it's interactive, for example, in that a teacher might, an elementary teacher might be working with multiple groups, uh, multiple small groups of students who are working on a science investigation. It's contingent in that the teacher needs to be able to um, respond in the moment to the kinds of inputs that children are giving in um, a whole class discussion, for example, of mathematics. Teaching is also both unnatural and intricate. It's unnatural, for example, in that a teacher is regularly asking questions to which she already knows the answers. We don't do that in our regular lives. Um, teacher is also regularly eliciting mistakes and problematic thinking as opposed to sweeping them under the rug, which is what we typically do as humans interacting in this world. Similarly, teaching is also, very, uh, is also quite intricate. Um, uh, a teacher is engaging in tasks and moves that could be completely invisible to a casual observer. Uh, and they're coordinating those tasks and moves with, with the goals that they have for that particular moment in time. They're managing 25 or more individuals who are moving towards understanding um, a particular subject matter in, within a particular caring environment. So there's a lot of internal complexity here to teaching. We argue that elementary teaching is even more complex in that it is so extensive in scope. So an elementary teacher is, as you know, responsible for teaching all academic subject areas, language arts, mathematics, social studies, science at the very least, sometimes more than these. The science educator in me feels compelled to note that by science, what we actually mean here is biology, geology, astronomy, physics, chemistry, right? My science ed colleagues here nodding, yes? Um, similar, similar range in some of the other subject areas as well, to be fair. An elementary teacher, of course, also needs to understand child development, recognize their professional obligations, and understand the social and democratic foundations of schooling. So elementary teachers need a rich knowledge base for teaching. They need to be able to understand, to have substantive knowledge of the discipline. They need to understand and be able to engage in disciplinary practices. So for example, being able to make a really careful scientific observation, being able to construct and revise a scientific model as examples. 
they need this knowledge not just as an expert would need it in the field, but they need that knowledge to be usable, as Deborah was saying, for teaching. At the same time, they need a robust suite of what we call high leverage teaching practices that constitute this rich base of um, a rich practice base for teaching. And I'll explain more about what I mean by that in a moment. They need this knowledge base and this practice base in all of the subject areas that they teach. And they need these to be able to support the learning of all of the learners in their classrooms. All right. So I'm going to turn to the University of Michigan uh, undergraduate elementary teacher ed program as an example of how we're working on these problems. Now I wanna note that we've been working on these problems for a long time. We haven't solved all of these problems, but we have made some headway. So I hope that by taking this as an example, it can help us all think together about ways in which we can approach this issue of practice-based teacher education. So our goal at U of M is to support novices in becoming well-started beginners. So by this in particular, I mean teachers who, first of all, demonstrate beginning levels of proficiency with this set of high leverage teaching practices. Second, I mean subject matter serious elementary teachers who are able to represent the content that they're teaching with integrity. And third, I mean ethical teachers who are able to, who, who recognize and are able to act on their professional obligations. We don't think that we're developing teachers who, end, who leave our program completely expert, but we do think that we can provide them with the tools that they need to engage in the further growth and development that, are, that they will require. So our program, our practice-based teacher education program is based on three pillars. The first is high leverage teaching practices. The second is content knowledge for teaching. And the third is ethical obligations, a set of ethical obligations. For today, I'm gonna to zero in on the high leverage teaching practices due to the focus of this particular conference. So what do I mean by high leverage practices? We developed a set of high leverage teaching practices that we wanted to use to, as the curriculum, essentially, for our program. And um, we developed this set that we wanted to focus on based on, a set of two, on two sets of considerations. The first set of considerations relates to high quality teaching. For example, we were interested in identifying practices that were likely to be powerful in advancing students' learning. We were also interested in identifying practices that were likely to be useful across many different con teaching contexts, contexts and many different content areas. This last piece is particularly important for us in the elementary program because we do want teachers to be able to apply these practices across, all of the, across a range of the subject areas that they teach in subject specific ways. Second set of considerations relates to high quality teacher education. So we wanted to identify practices in particular that could be actually learned by a beginner and that we could, as a program, assess. So some examples of the kinds of high leverage practices that we've chosen to focus on. Explaining core content, choosing and using representations and examples, engaging students in rehearsing an organizational routine, choosing and modifying lesson plans for a specific learning goal, and conducting a meeting with a parent or guardian about a student. I wanna note that these are written in a subject neutral way. Uh, we're working in an elementary program, and as I said, we want these to be able to be applied across many different content areas. However, many of these actually are, um, they, they play out in a subject specific way. So for, for example, you can't explain core content in a subject neutral way. You're talking about some particular content. Similarly, when you're choosing and using representations and examples, you're choosing representations and examples about content. So for example, identifying a good instructional representation to use when you're teaching children about electric current. Um, is important Do you think about using water th flowing through pipes or teeming crowds or some other example. So they play out in subject specific ways, many of these. Some of them can play out in either subject neutral or subject specific ways. So for example, 
when you're engaging ch children in a, in a managerial routine, you might be getting them to line up for, to go to lunch. That's subject neutral, right? Although many students do say that lunch is their favorite subject, but that's okay. Um, but it may also play out in a subject specific way. For example, this is how we work when we're working in our math, in our math centers. Um, similarly, conducting a meeting with a parent or guardian um, might be subject neutral or it might be subject specific depending on what the meeting is focused on. So how do we support interns' development? Well, this set of high leverage practices leads us to a third kind of pedagogy that Pam Grossman has identified, pedagogies of practice. So these pedagogies of practice support beginning teachers in being able to do the work of teaching. So Pam Grossman and her colleagues have identified um, three different methods of teaching professional, pro pro professional practice. Representations of practice is the first. So for example, using video records or cases in teacher education. Decompositions of practice, working on elements of lesson planning or working on writing on, writing on the board or using one's voice in very small decompositions. Um, approximations of practice are a third pedagogy. Uh, for example, engaging students in a role play or a rehearsal or um, teaching a small group of students rather than the whole, rather than the whole class. Pam talks about approximations of practice as being opportunities for novices to engage in practices that are more or less proximal to the practices of a profession. We're trying to think about these, um, these different pedagogies of practice, both within specific courses in our program, but also programmatically. So I would like to give you a, a few examples of how we approximate practice with our interns. The first example that I'll draw on um, occurs in the context of a class that we call Managing to Teach. Managing to Teach is a class that occurs across the program in different, at different points in time. The, uh, and one of the practices, the main practice that is of focus in this particular class is engaging students in an organizational or managerial routine. So in the first, um, the first instantiation of the Managing to Teach class, which happens in September of the first year of the interns um, program, so they're juniors in their very first month of the program, um, interns begin to observe classroom routines. So they move, from, for, uh, they, they move around uh, middle school classrooms in small groups and they observe um, middle school teachers engaging their children in beginning the school year kinds of um, routines. Uh, and they're also charged with ob making observations of routines in their field placement classrooms, which are um, lower elementary classrooms as well, as well. So they're beginning to observe routines and they're also beginning to engage in rehearsal. So starting to make their practice public in a way that um, allows them to practice with their peers and also receive real-time feedback from teacher educators as well as colleagues. So in this case, they're rehearsing giving directions for a routine classroom activity. Lining up for lunch might be an example that they might work on. Then in Managing to Teach 2, the second version of the, the second instantiation of this class, which happens in January of their first year in the program, uh, again, they're working on the same practice related to routines. And again, they're engaging in a set of observations, this time in elementary classrooms. Um, and they're um, continuing their work on rehearsals. So here, for example, they're working on rehearsing, giving directions, distributing materials, for example, for a science investigation, and using public writing spaces. For example, writing the day's schedule on the board or um, devising and enacting a way of um, collecting students' ideas uh, with regard to a particular math problem that has been posed. So these are very small scale practices. So these are pretty tiny decompositions of, of teaching practice. But we argue that without success in these very small scale practices, interns are unlikely to be successful in the larger scale instruction of, of content that they need to engage in. So we want them to develop some, some, some skill and proficiency around these small scale practices. Um, the focus in, the, in this particular class is on being proactive to address the uh, endemic problems of practice that, te that we know teachers will face. We argue with the, with the interns, we argue that 
the more time you can spend having your class go smoothly, then the more time that you are able to engage in actual instruction. So we try to help them be able to head off some of those endemic problems of practice by having some routines in place. A second example is drawn from a class called Children as Sense Makers. And just as a heads up, there will be a further discussion of this, uh, of this class at one of the breakout <coughs> sessions this afternoon, um, led by Megan Shaughnessy and Anne-Marie Palansar. So this will be a little ad for that. So in Children as Sense Makers 1, which also happens in September of the intern's um, first year of the program, so when they're very first starting the program, they're working on practices related to eliciting, interpreting, and developing students' thinking. Here, they're working on particular content, and in this case, the content is in the context of science, and they're working on the phenomenon of day and night. What causes day and night? They're working with one lower elementary child, and they interview the child, they engage in a in, in an interactive read aloud with the child using a science trade book that addresses the phenomenon of day and night. They use a physical model with the child to explore the child's ideas about what causes day and night. And then they do another interview in which they assess the child's understanding after that experience. They're working very carefully on this idea of eliciting, interpreting, and developing thinking, but with one child. In Children as Sense Makers 2, which happens later in their first year of their program, here, again, the focus is on these same practices related to eliciting, interpreting, and developing students' thinking. The content has changed. Now the content is in mathematics, and in particular, fractions. And they're working with a small group of middle school students, again, engaging in an interview, and here, designing and implementing targeted instruction. So you can see that the, the um, the particular teaching practice has become a little bit more complex, and also different things have changed as well. So the, the content has changed and the age of the children has, has changed as well. A third example is taken from a science methods class that happens in the second year of the program. Here we begin to recompose some of these practices. So the practice that is labeled here is a little bit bigger, uh, engaging students in science investigations. This actually entails a set of multiple high leverage practices. In this particular class, we use a continuum of approximations of practice. And I wanna explain why that's important in this context. Uh, science, as some of you may know, science is taught very infrequently in typical elementary classrooms in the United States, and southeastern Michigan is really no exception to that. So we have an obligation to develop a set of really rich approximations of practice for our novice teachers to be able to engage in some science teaching, given the limited opportunities that they have to observe and teach science in their placement classrooms. So, the first of these approximations of practice is something that we call peer teaching. Here, interns are teaching lesson segments with a small group of peers and one or more teacher educators. So this has some similarities to the kinds of rehearsals. Um, you saw an example of Sarah Scott engaging her interns in a rehearsal in the literacy um, video clip that Francesca saw. Peer teaching has some similarities to that. We don't call these rehearsals because we know that interns aren't highly likely to be able to teach these particular lessons with children. So they're mainly using them to, as an opportunity to work on these practices with one another. The second example of an approximation of practice in this class is small scale field-based teaching experiences. Here, again, they're teaching a lesson segment rather than a whole lesson. And they're teaching these, these segments to elementary children in their field placement classrooms. Some of them will be able to teach the whole class. Some of them are teaching a small group. So there's a range even within this one approximation of practice to what extent it truly approximates or comes proximal to the, um, the uh, actual authentic teaching practice. And then final, a final approximation of practice is teaching a full science lesson in their placement classroom. So you see across this continuum of approximations of practice, authenticity is increasing across this continuum. The complexity of the work that interns are expected to engage in is, in, is increasing, and the scaffolding is decreasing. 
So how do we assess interns in this work? As Francesca noted, assessment is another key piece to practice-based teacher education. So our program level assessments of teaching practice uh, are intended to allow us to capture and appraise the, the actual doing of teaching. This is important for us that we're getting at least some read on how the interns are actually able to engage in these practices that we want them to engage in. These are used in conjunction with course level assessments. So right now I'm talking mainly about the program-wide program assessments. These program level assessments are conducted in a variety of settings and at key points across the program. So the settings can range from real classroom settings to simulation, uh, simulation kinds of opportunities, performance centers, and so forth. And at key points in the program, by this I mean um, that uh, we have a set of baseline assessments that are conducted actually on the very first day that our, the interns come to our program. So they have an orientation and then we start assessing them. This is an opportunity to, for us to be able to work actually entail what, how complex is this? They start to have their eyes opened about the complexity of teaching that, that actually just liking kids a lot probably isn't going to be sufficient as a teacher. Um, it also gives us a read on what we can work on with the, with the interns as they move into their first few months of their program. We have another set of assessments at the end of the first year of the program and then another set at the end of the second year of the program. At the end of year one, we're really checking to see are they ready to assume greater responsibility in, in their teaching work. And at the, end of the, um, at the end of year two, of course, that's our program, our program exit. These, the, the interns work on these assessments is appraised through our collective professional deliberation. So we as teacher educators work together to appraise how the interns are performing on these, on these um, assessments. And the assessments are, we are attempting to organize these to be both efficient and sustainable. So the purposes of these program level assessments um, first, we want to, of course, determine interns' proficiency with the practices, and a part of this is also to provide feedback to the interns so that they know how they're doing with the kinds of practices that we're valuing. This helps, us to, um, this helps to support our own instructional decision making and helps, of course, to demonstrate our program's effectiveness. Stakeholders range from the interns and the instructors to program administrators as well as our accrediting organizations, such as the State Department of Ed. So to give you a few examples of what this can look like actually. So one example is an assessment of how teachers are engaging in management moves. So as I mentioned, they have this series of courses that's focused on classroom management or managing to teach. And we want to be able to see how are interns doing with this work of classroom, classroom management. So the high leverage practice in this case is engaging students in an organizational or managerial routine here, the assessment is actually taking the form of video records of examples of the intern enacting particular managerial moves. So the, the, the evidence that they turn in to us is a video and a very short little write-up that gives us a bit of the context of what they were doing. But our assessment is really around what they are actually doing with the kids, the video record. Another, and this, that assessment, the management assessment, um, we've used at the end of the first year to kind of see, check in and see how they're doing with the management piece at the end of the first year of their program. Second example is an introduction letter to families. Um, here, we're um, checking to see, the, uh, checking on the practice of writing correct, comprehensible, and professional messages to colleagues, parents, and others. In this case, interns are supposed asked to draft a letter uh, introducing themselves to the families of the, the children in their classrooms. They do this on the very first day of the program. This is one of our baseline assessments. So we're not anticipating that they know all of the technical jargon about what they, what they should be perhaps saying to par parents about how they're going to be teaching, although it does give us a read on what kinds of things they value. For example, do they mention all of the subject areas or do they mention none of the subject areas? Um, but it also gives us a, a, a read on um, issues like their technological proficiency and their um, proficiency with written, with written English and to what extent do we, it gives us a flag to identify interns who we might need to provide a little bit of additional support to.
A third example focusing, focuses on eliciting and analyzing students' thinking. And in this case, interns analyze a set of student work in mathematics, and then they interview a simulated student to elicit and probe the student's thinking. This is drawing on the standardized patient model in medical education, so another reference to medical education as well. This in, um, the thing to note about this is that it provides us with a set of uh, data on the interns that is consistent across. So we know that the protocol is being followed with the simulated interview, and so it eliminates some of the issues of context. We wouldn't want all of our assessments to take this form, nor would we want all of the assessments to take, to take place in the elementary classrooms in which the interns are working, because we want to be able to triangulate across these forms of evidence. So what challenges have we faced? Well, we faced several in doing this work, and I just want to touch on a few that relate mainly to the work around practice-based, um, the focus on practice in particular. One piece is choosing and articulating the practices that we um, wanted to focus on across the teaching of multiple subjects. We've made some bets on this, and we're engaged in work right now to identify whether those bets were, were good ones. Um, so far, it looks good. Um, we're working on designing courses and structures that can be collectively taught and stable over time. One of the goals that we have for ourselves is to address every subject matter in every semester so that the subject matters don't get quite so siloed as they often do in elementary teacher ed programs. Um, but that means that we need to have a lot of expertise as teacher educators. So this issue of building capacity among ourselves to do this work of teacher education is really crucial for us. Similarly, we're working on supporting and maintaining settings for practice-based learning opportunities. So the idea of partnership schools and being really able to work seamlessly with, uh, with teachers in elementary and middle schools um, to engage in our work of teacher education is really important for our work, it takes an, an, an enormous amount of time, and it's also enormously rewarding for us. And then a final set, has to do, a set of challenges has to do with um, assessment. So first, developing the assessment tasks that actually can elicit the intended practices and making sure that those are fair across different contexts of the appraisal. So just as a reminder to take a step back, our program, I focused in today on the high leverage teaching practices, but our program is actually founded on three pillars. The high leverage practices being one, and content knowledge for teaching, and the ethical obligations being the other two. Um, we argue that you can't, we, we can't have a practice-based teacher education program without all three of those pillars, because practices in the absence of content knowledge and in the absence of the ethical obligations of the work of teaching, um, is, uh, is, is um, empty, we would argue. So in exploring ways to address the program level challenges, not just around the, um, around the practices, but also around content knowledge for teaching and uh, the ethical obligations, we've established three sort of categories of work for ourselves. One is a set of foundational frameworks one is social structures, and one is programmatic structures. So by foundational frameworks, I mean, for example, our set of high leverage practices and our set of ethical obligations that guide our work. We also have developed a document that we refer to internally as our principles and assumptions document that really sets the parameters of what we need to be, what we need to be keeping in mind as supporting that instructionally and um, setting up our program so that we can use time flexibly uh, and working against university bureaucracy in doing so. So as we move forward, we're continuing to refine the design and structure of our program so that it is focused on the development of well-started beginning teachers. We're continuing to refine these structures and frameworks that I just mentioned um, with the goal of enhancing the sustainability, consistency, and coherence of our program. And finally, we're establishing our, a research program that contributes both to our internal program um, develop, Im improvement as well as to the wider profession. So with that, I'll stop and turn it over to Mandela. I have a couple of frames from which I'm gonna comment on these two examples, and I'd like to share those with you to start with. <clears throat> 
One is, I'd like to talk about two different meanings of the word practice. Secondly, I'd like to talk about the multiple complexities of the relationships that must be managed in teaching practice. And thirdly, I'd like to raise the question of how something as complex as teaching practice might be learned. Today we're going to hear about research on children's and adolescents' learning that should contribute to practice-based teacher education. I think we should have another conference on what we know about the learning of complex practices that should contribute to the design of our work. So practice may have it, it has many meanings, but it has at least two that I think have permeated the conversation so far this morning. One, a practice is something that a teacher does to teach. But another meaning of practice that was implied in several of the things that um, Lynn and Emily and Betsy talked about is the ongoing pursuit of a craft or a profession with a shared language, shared tools, and shared principles to support action. I would argue that learning ambitious practices, like the ones Betsy was talking about, depends on creating and sustaining a practice of ambitious teaching. And I'll talk more about what that means in the examples, but I'd like you to think about the relationship between those two things as you go through the day. The second frame is this notion of teaching as a relational practice. A relationship between the teacher, the class, and something to be taught and learned that happens in a context. One thing about that relationship is that the teacher is relating to a student around a particular piece of content and needs to connect the student to the content. That's why that extra arrow is in the middle. And needs to work simultaneously with the student, with the content, and on making the connection, and at the same time, remain in relationship with a school, a district, a curriculum, parents, assessments, and so on. So practice is that whole ball of wax. And there are three kinds of complexities in those relationships. One of social interaction, one of, so of subject matter, and there's a complexity of time. Now, I, I don't have presentation tools in front of me, but I'm going to skip over a couple of slides here. Um, this is not elegant, but I'm, I apologize. So the final frame that I bring to my commentary is what and I'm just going to say very brief things about this. What do learning theory and research tell us about how a practice as complex as teaching is learned? One thing it tells us is that the capacity to use knowledge, skill, and judgment adaptively, that is, in ways that depend on who your students are, is learning in a continuous cycle of enactment and investigation. So our pedagogies of teacher education for practice need to have that cycle in them. And secondly, the development of the will that is required to teach in ways that enable all students to have the uh, ability to acquire authentic academic knowledge is learned in communities of practice. So will is not inside of an individual, it's a collective thing. 
many people know how to teach ambitiously, but they don't have the will to do it. And I think we need to try much more seriously, not only to give all teachers the will to do it, but to give teachers the will to stay in classrooms for more than one year. So how do um, what our speakers talked about relate to these three frames? Will I cause a major problem if I close this computer? Okay. Will the lights go off? Will it go off? Okay, good. So um, Lynn and Emily um, are preparing teachers for New York City. The teachers in the residency program make a commitment to stay teaching in New York City. So they're preparing teachers for a district whose curriculum, assessments, politics, teacher population, and most importantly, student population are known to the teacher educators. And interestingly, they're working in a city and in a state which is probably in the forefront of being systematized in terms of its curriculum and assessments. Um, I work mainly in Boston, although I do some work here in New York for New Visions for Public Schools, and the difference is amazing. Uh, teachers' evaluations, students' evaluations, um, the way teachers work together is organized in New York is pretty consistent compared with other major urban districts. So all of those things are a known commodity and they are known by the teacher educator who is educating beginning teachers. That means a lot when you're preparing novices to deal with the context in which they're going to relate to students and subject matter. One of the things I remember distinctly from the Summer Learning Institute in 2007 in which Sarah Scott taught the uh, rehearsal that you saw the video of is that we saw the children all day, every day, in the same context in which we were preparing novices to teach those same children. You can't hide in that kind of a setting as a teacher educator. When the sort of stuff that you're trying to teach novices is happening to real children right in front of your eyes and in a continuous cycle of enactment and investigation. A second thing about a teacher education program that has the kind of um, relationship between preparation and induction that Lynn talked about is that teacher learning trajectories are central. If they commit to sticking around, what you're doing actually is creating a community of practice with more and less knowledgeable others. So it's not only that the teacher educators can work with the, the same people in induction that they worked with in preparation, but the grads, as we call them in the, t in the Boston Teacher Residency, can work with the beginners. So you know your grads if they're in the same school district that your beginners are in and you can engage them in a learning community. I think it was Lynn who used the term mentor teacher when she began to talk about rounds. And one of the questions both uh, Lynn and Emily and Betsy raised for me is, what is the role of the full-time school practitioner who's teaching in the classroom in practice-based teacher education? I don't think we've, uh, we've really become clear about how to involve those people in both the teaching and assessment of novices. That the options 
was back at Teachers College. What difference would it make if it were happening in the school and school personnel were also involved in that debrief? What does it mean to have the enactment phase happen in the school and the investigation phase happen in the university? And then back to the school and then back to the university. I'm, I'm not making a judgment about one way or the other, but I thought that was interesting. It also made me think about Francesca's example of medical rounds and the medical educator being an attending physician. So when residents are doing rounds in medicine, the medical educator is the doctor who's in charge of the patient. Uh, I have to say my, my uh, education ar around uh, the role of the med medical educator comes entirely from Gray's Anatomy. <laughs> but I, I highly encourage you, if you have not, never seen Gray's Anatomy and you're interested in practice-based teacher education and you don't mind a little hanky-panky on the side, um, <laughs> you should watch it. It's really, really fascinating. The other thing that strikes me about that um, slide that, that Francesca showed us is there's a group of people around the patient. Teaching has always been a single adult and a group of learners. So when we talk about practice-based teacher education and partnering between beginners and more experienced others, as in the attending physician partnering with residents, we're changing not only the structure of teacher education, but the structure of schooling. I was interested in, uh, at this point I think it was Emily who was speaking, the notion of residents bringing a question of practice that they were curious about and a, at a question about which the answer should be observable. Um, why not a problem of practice? She did say a question or a problem or an issue. And what does it mean to call it a question or call it a problem or call it... Some of you know I wrote a famous article called When the Problem is Not the Question and the Solution is Not the Answer or the answer is not the solution, I can never get it right. Um, another thing Emily talked about was low stakes opportunities to be observed. And the, we listened to a young man who spoke about what it's like to be observed and what it's like to hear people talk about your practice. I would say it's not only low stakes opportunities to be observed, but low stakes opportunities to practice, be observed, and get feedback. <laughs> Keeping that enactment and investigation cycle going. One of the things that was really striking was how many times Emily used the word protocol and structure when she talked about giving a novice feedback on his or her practice. A very carefully defined and designed structure. The same thing was true in the kind of rehearsal that Sarah Scott ran that you saw um, on the video. And knowing what that structure is within which you are going to be publicly observed by your peers and by more knowledgeable others and be given feedback lowers the anxiety. So it's not just about the same old, same old of field observation, the, you know, clinic, the observer comes in and just says whatever comes into his or her mind. It's very designed and thought through. It's also public and social 
and cultural, what counts as a problem? What counts as something to discuss in that kind of uh, situation? And this is where I, I want to mention George Herbert Mead because I think that we don't pay enough at attention to the development of identity in teaching. Identity as a teacher who has ambitious goals for all children. I was very struck in listening to those novices on the videos in, in terms of they're talking about who they are and who they learn to be. Uh, someone said, and I think this was Emily, or it may, may have been one of the people on the video, reflecting what you saw them doing, meaning that the person who's doing the teaching sort of knows what they're doing, but you have all these observers and you say back to them what you saw them doing. Me talked about the relationship between the I, me. The I is who I think I am. The me is who you think I am. And my identity is formed from the relationship between those two things. I act from within who I think I am, and you react to me based on who you think I am and what I'm trying to do. So these public situations in which people are learning to teach are about forming the will to be a certain kind of person. So moving on to Betsy, um, Betsy talked very uh, early on about the difficulty of teaching someone to do a practice that is interactive and contingent. How does the fact that teaching is interactive and contingent affect the design of practice-based teacher education? Well, maybe it means we can't all stand around the bed while somebody works on the patient because that would seriously interfere with what the person who's working on the patient, in our case, the student, is able to do. And how does the, the uh, uh, interactivity and contingency of teaching affect the roles of the mentor or collaborating teacher and the role of the teacher educator? Betsy talked about um, the three pillars, high leverage teaching practices, subject matter knowledge for teaching, and ethical oblig obligations. And um, one of the things that I thought a lot about seeing those three pillars is, is that a good representation? At the end, Betsy came back around to saying, we can't work on one without working on the other. So are they, this has to do with program design. Because if we give them a distinct and non-overlapping category, this is over here, we'll work on subject matter knowledge for teaching over here, and we'll work on ethical obligations over here. But in practice, all three of those are in every action that you take as a teacher. So it's not a theoretical question, that is, are these overlapping or are they distinct? It's a practical question. Who teaches these things to beginners? Do we have one teacher educator who teaches high leverage practices, another teacher educator who teaches subject matter knowledge for teaching, and another teacher educator who teaches ethical obligations? Where do these things happen? Do they happen in the school? Do they happen in the university? In what order do they happen? In other words, when do they happen? And I wondered at that point, how does working on high leverage practices, ethical obligations, and subject matter for teaching come up in or not 
when a resident in the teacher's college program brings a question of practice to the group. Are they working on those three things or are they working on yet another thing? And when a uh, novice brings a, a question of practice or, or a uh, question of practice to the group, what's the role of the teacher educator in that setting? Perhaps we might think of the role of the teacher educator being to make sure that around that question we're talking about practices, subject matter knowledge for teaching, and ethical obligations. Betsy talked about two uh, classes in the newly designed elementary program, one called Managing to Teach, which focused on routines, and one called Children as Sense Makers. Um, which focused on eliciting, interpreting, and developing student thinking. This also raised a question in my mind of which comes first. And how is the rehearsal of giving directions that, that um, Betsy talked about different from or similar to the rehearsal that we saw Sarah Scott doing when she was working with a novice on teaching the word wind in the context of an instructional activity that's common to the balanced literacy um, method of instruction. So which comes first? Do they happen at the same time? Um, and then uh, Betsy said, in science methods class, we begin to recompose. Again, how does that happen? How does putting it all back together happen? And what's the role of the teacher educator in that? And finally, assessing of teaching practice. Um, at the Boston Teacher Residency this year, uh, for the first year, we tried using a rubric on planning and teaching a lesson where the lesson involved leading a whole class discussion focused on a content goal, K-12 in all subject matter areas. There's a lot I could say about it, but the overwhelming thing was how much the teacher educators learned about the complexity of practice from the process of high stakes judgment because all of the residents had to achieve proficiency on all of the um, parts of the rubric in order to graduate. And they didn't all achieve proficiency. So this is really different than giving grades in a course that you teach from the point of view of a teacher educator. And it's really hard to learn to do. Who judges performance? Betsy said the teacher educators judge the performance in the, um, the University of Michigan program. Where does the teacher educator get the authority to do that? I don't mean to say that he or she doesn't have the authority, but where do you get the authority to say this is acceptable performance and this is not? What's the classroom teacher's role in participating in that judgment of performance of high leverage practices? And what's the student's role? And by that I mean not only what do they, how do they experience the teaching that we're trying to teach novices to do, but what are they learning? And how do we take whether students are actually learning something into account in practice-based teacher education? I mean, we take it into account as teacher educators when we're in the classroom, we teach our novices how to do something. They go in the, pl in the classroom, they do a really fantastic job, but the students don't learn anything. I mean, I'm sort of simplifying, but <laughs> 
you kind of get the point. And in, in all of this practice-based teacher education, and I'm, I'm coming now back to the medical example, where are the people who are really good at teaching? What role do they play? And I'll leave you with that thought and release you, I think, to be able to get a cup of coffee <laughs> and whatever else you need to do. Thank you.